Welcome to the revived uh, Twilight Lectures. Uh, some of you who have been here before uh, uh, may remember that we used to do lectures around, uh, around Twilight for, with visitors that had interesting oh. things to say. And we haven't done it for, for a little while, um, but we're incredibly lucky to have among us wow. uh, Professor Deborah Wong from the uh, University of California, Riverside, who's already been sharing very generously uh, with us uh, on a number of the things that she, she, uh, she is working on and in discussing what she could do a lecture on, uh, both for us here and for uh, an, an audience of many thousands through the, 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 the video. Um, Deborah was quite, quite uh, interested in, in addressing a topic that we've been discussing quite a lot in the, the context of the Sustainable Futures Project, which is how do you deal with sustainability of traditions? And one of the things she's going to be talking about is how do you deal with sustainability, not so much of disappearing traditions, but how do you deal with sustainability of traditions that are actually quite vibrant, yeah. and what do you do to ensure they stay vibrant? Um, I think Deborah is much more qualified than I, than I am to speak about that. So please uh, welcome Deborah <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, would, would you all mind just going around real quick and telling me your, your names and like, you know, who you are and what you do, real, real quick. I mean, I've met some of you over the last few days, but certainly not all of you. Hi, what, what I'm you Vanessa mean? Tomlinson. I'm on the faculty here, oh. um, head of percussion and a researcher in artistic practice. Fantastic. Research. Okay, good to meet you. <laughs> Liz. Liz Kingley from the School of Education at the University of Queensland. <laughs> so happy to see you. Yeah. And I'm Sue Monk, uh, also in education, but a group with university. Okay. I'm Jane Postdoc, uh, research fellowship. Uh, University of Newcastle. Um, Kathy. You're Kathy. Looking forward to meeting with you yeah, tomorrow. You. Hanging. Yeah. Good. I'm Louise, lecturer in the jazz area here. Yes. Oh. Composer educator. Fabulous. Good to meet you. Mifty Turpin, University of Queensland. Linguistics, mm. level of an Aboriginal song. Wonderful. And Miff is one of the research fellows on, on this project as well. Ah, okay. Well, okay. Great. Emma, and I'm a PhD candidate here. You sure are, yeah. <laughs> uh, Sharon Blum, I'm also um, doing my PhD and helps my supervisor, mm -hmm. so I think we're going to meet on Thursday. Oh, okay. Thursday. Yeah. Using um, a lot of world music, sitting and um, looking at children's creativity. I look forward to sitting down with you, yeah. I'm yeah. Then, I'm still in high school. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> My name is James. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Macquarie University in Sydney, oh. um, and I study uh, hip hop in Australia. Wow, neat, great, yeah. Thank you all for being here. I mean, I'm just I'm having so much fun here, and 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 you know, I, you always just set things up so that you know I end up connecting with people while I'm here, and that's like it doesn't get better than that. So so I'm really having a great time. Yeah. Um, um, I've been watching the Sustainable Futures project unfold for, you know, five, six years now, right? And it's made me think in all kinds of ways I never would have expected. So that's where I'm coming from today and what I'm going to share with you. And uh, yeah, I hope you can see what I have up there. I'm going to roll right into it. And um, I really do invite uh, your comments, your redirection, your, you know, your objections, whatever. I, your responses to this would be very useful to me. Um, I've said this at I don't know how many talks, but it's actually true this time that I am finishing <laughs> my book on Tycho, and, and this is drawn directly from that final chapter. Um, I think for three years I've been saying I'm finishing the book, blah, 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 but I actually really did this summer, so, <laughs> so it's true, yeah. Um, I'm going to compare and contrast um, two very vibrant Japanese-American traditions um, today. Um, Bon Odori, as you see on the left, and um, Taiko. I'm assuming you all know what Taiko is. I mean, at this point, who doesn't know what Taiko is, right? It's everywhere, especially in Australia and New Zealand, right? And what I'm going to do through looking at these two forms um, is to ask a bigger question. And I'm going to take the risk of like going like that without even looking. So if something doesn't happen, you'll let me know, right? Or if it's like the wrong slide, you'll let me know, right? Okay. Um, I'm going to ask, you know, what can vibrant traditions tell us about 
the ecology of musical diversity. This is the this is the the question behind um, Professor Skipper's massive, ambitious project that many of you here are involved in, right? Um, I'm talking about sustainable futures for music cultures toward an ecology of musical diversity. And the first stage of that project took place between 2009 and 2014. Did I get that right? Yeah, okay. And the second stage of that big project is, you know, in the process of unfolding as we sit here. And one can say that that project really stands out for its focus on a super big question. Uh, why do some traditions thrive while others wither and die? And I would venture to say that ethnomusicologists, well, we love big questions and we ask them constantly. But in fact, we rarely address those big questions in big ways. <laughs> we have this long, honorable tradition of working alone, you know? toiling solo in the humanistic tradition, as it were. Um, we tend to do our ethnographic research alone. We tend to write it up alone. Most of our publications are, in fact, solo authored. Um, I'm well aware that some of you in this room do quite the opposite, Liz McKinley. And it's really cool that some of you do, because, I mean, we really need to push against that paradigm of, you know, the, you know, the, the solo hero author, as it were. And the Sustainable Futures Project, I'd, I would say, is the result of really uh, dedicated teamwork. Teamwork that offers a really big comparative view of issues that are you know, long and tough and systemic and long term. And I congratulate all of you in this room um, on being part of that project in one way or another um, for your committed work on that project because it really stands out sort of in the history of ethnomusicology as a discipline. Um, I would say that, that, that your music sustainable, sustainability project is basically ethical at heart. That's how I see it at this point. Ethical at heart, I think. And my purpose today is to share with all of you the ways that this project has led me to ask questions about my own research in ways that I frankly would not otherwise have done. Now, and I can say that because my, my connection to your project has been, you know, from the sidelines, you know, but nonetheless I've been uh, quite, quite affected by it in all kinds of, you know, in deep ways. As I, I'm sure most of you know here, um, the first stage of the project focused on nine different traditions from Vietnam, Ghana, Australia, uh, Mexico, Hindustani music, Japanese, one form of Mino, uh, Korean, uh, Balinese gamelan, and Western opera. Um, and some of those traditions, as I understand it, were chosen for the project because they were endangered, and others were chosen for quite the opposite reason, because they were, you know, vibrant. And one of the payoffs of the project is this model that you're looking at, outlining um, five key domains, as they're, as they're called, um, that constitute the ecosystem of music cultures. And those five domains are, and each of them is a different color up there, it's a great chart, um, education and transmission, artists and communities, contexts and constructs, infrastructure and regulations, and media and the music industry. Yeah, and we're on the right slide and everything. The specific links or ruptures between any of these domains basically make up the unique character of any given tradition at any given historical moment. Now, one of the nice tensions in the project's model is the apparent focus on uh, music. And at this point, whenever I say music, there's always like, you know, scare quotes around it. But in, in, in this, I would say it's shaped by the empirical assumption, which is shared, frankly, by all areas of music scholarship, um, that music is an object, that music is an object. And this logos is so very deeply part of our critical ideologies that um, it's basically impossible for us um, not to think and to write and to talk about music in any other way, music as an object. It's very deep with all of us. Now, Christopher Small's um, construct of musicking was an absolute intervention in all of this. Absolute intervention. Turning music into a verb rather than a noun is what he did. Um, and he created a way through his writing and through that shift in language uh, to force us to think of music as an activity rather than as an object. You know, thank you, Christopher Small. His work is, is wonderful and very, very important. And really, he thought that um, 
that the Western, uh, especially art music, shift towards um, the music object was the problem. And he wrote about it at great um, and very eloquent length. And basically the second half of his life was, was devoted to writing about that, that problem. Now, put simply, um, Professor Skipper's sustainability project seems to be about music, but I would say it's actually about people and, and communities that music, okay? Music as, as the verb here. And the project seems to ask what the terms are for music sustainability, but I think, again, I would say it's actually about the terms for sustaining the, the people who music. And, and there's a real difference between, you know, thinking about whether it's music or communities are at the heart of the thing. In dramatic ways, I'd say that the project shows what it takes to maintain dynamic and healthy and supportive environments for uh, musicians and, in fact, musicking communities. Perhaps it's simpler to ask how and why uh, Hindustani music or Balinese gamelan music or mariachi music has been sustained. Perhaps it's simpler, but the music isn't a thing um, despite its objectification by oh, music industries and much, much more. Um, it's always a set of activities, really, that take place between people. I think all of us in the room know this and believe it. And the chief question, I think, built into that is how and why certain communities are sustained or coerced or scattered or contained or honored or reviled or, in fact, rendered illegal, how those communities shift and change. And as Tony Seeger put it, um, some musics um, are disappeared. They don't disappear, they are disappeared. This is an active disappearing, you know. Or to put it another way, some communities are disappeared, right? And that's when the music falls silent. Now, this is the power, I think, of the Music Sustainability Project. What are the mechanisms for sustaining music in communities? You know, to me, that's, that's the question. And one of the things I value most about uh, the project is that there's, there's no expectation that music wouldn't change. It's all over the project. The expectation that, of course, music would change. <laughs> music is assumed to be dynamic, is assumed to be responsive. And with these thoughts in mind, I'd like to show you um, in broad outline how the project has led me to ask frankly, a very late-breaking question about my own research project, a question that I wouldn't have otherwise asked. Um, why is Tycho doing so very, very, very well? Um, why are so many new Tycho groups um, just bursting into existence? It seems like every week. It's really quite stunning. How and why are these Tycho groups um, connected? Are they, you know, a community? Because, in fact, Tycho players talk about that, the Tycho community, as if it were one big thing. Um, what conditions and practices have made, you know, the explosion of this tradition possible? You know, that's an important one. Um, is the rapid expansion of this tradition, or indeed any tradition, is it necessarily a good thing? I'm really asking that at this point. You know, we tend to assume, of course, if it's alive and well, it's a good thing, you know. And I'm asking if we focus on music as an object, well then, yes, more instances of that object could be seen as a good thing, good thing. More is more, right? More is more. More music. <laughs> more of those compelling and beautiful sounds. How can that not be a good thing, right? But if we ask about communities rather than music, I think a different picture can come into view. Now, I'm gonna give you some, this is where I'm gonna get all, all you know, ethnographic and bound up and I'm gonna shift now into you know, the details of, of the stuff I've been looking at for the last 15 years, basically. I'm gonna show you some maps. Basically, Tycho is found in two different kinds of places. Uh, number one, Tycho is found in uh, Japanese diasporic communities around the world, um, especially North America and Latin America. And the second place that Tycho is found um, is where there are a lot of first world white people. And I'm going to tell you more. Yes, first world white people was the phrase I just used. Um, and I'm going to show you more about that in just a second. Um, these maps of where Tycho is happening um, are very incomplete. There's a whole bunch of different people sort of trying to map what's going on with Tycho, um, you know, for better or for worse. So they are incomplete, but they still tell us a lot, nonetheless. So 
North America, whoa, lots of Tycho. <laughs> okay, we're probably about 300 groups at this point. Um, sort of the southern hemisphere. Um, the ones you're seeing um, here in Latin America are very much, you know, Peru uh, primarily and also Brazil are the result of uh, Japanese immigration to those, those countries. Uh, there is exactly one Tycho group in the entire continent of Africa and that would be in South Africa, as you can see. Um, this is interesting. I mean, okay, so obviously in Japan there are lots of Tycho groups, okay. And, you know, probably 3,000, 4,000, nobody really knows there's so many, all right. Look at Western Europe. Oh my goodness, look at all those Tycho groups. Lots and lots and lots of them. First world white people is, is my point. Yeah, that's a very sloppy way of talking about things, but, but you know, there's something to it. And just so you realize, I mean, Australia and New Zealand are actually, you know, really active in terms of, of, of Tycho. And um, tomorrow night, I'm gonna get to see the, the University of Queensland group. What's it called, Queensland Tycho? Anyway, I'm very excited about this, yeah. No. No, they're busy actually. I tried to get with them. Yeah, so after tomorrow night I can tell you more. <laughs> yeah. Um, and last but not least, um, in the United States there's this 15-year-old, this, uh, um, I'm going to call it a tradition, of collegiate Tycho groups. Um, very much student driven uh, and completely vibrant. I mean it's quite stunning how, how obsessed and passionate <laughs> those, those young people are about playing taiko um, on university and college campuses. Now, so that's sort of, you know, you're quick and dirty, this is where taiko is happening. And in fact, it's not all over the world, right? It's in particular parts of the world. And that's very important to, to understand when people say, oh, taiko's everywhere. Well, it isn't everywhere. It's in specific places, I think, for real reasons. Now, if I can venture to say the Japanese American community faces three very significant challenges and one is of course the Japanese American internment. I'll say more on that as I go along. Um, the other is out marriage and the third issue is the sort of cultural absorption due to um, model minority success and these three matters are, are deeply and profoundly interrelated. In a longer presentation I would say a lot more about all of that, but let it suffice to say that, that Japanese Americans, this is interesting, Japanese Americans have um, the very highest proportion of marriage to non-Japanese Americans and, and, and non-Asian Americans than any other Asian American um, you know, ethnic group in the United States. Um, let me put it another way about 75% of Japanese Americans have spouses or long-term partners who are neither Japanese American nor Asian American. 75%, think about that. And most of them, in fact, um, pair off with white Americans. Not all of them, but most of them. Um, these patterns are very, very, very pronounced to the point that um, when you meet fourth or fifth generation Japanese Americans, most of them are multi-ethnic in one way or another. It's absolutely fascinating. Most of them still self-identify as Japanese American. That's also very interesting. Now, rather than, as we could, celebrate this as you know evidence of a you know a post-racial nation, you know, yay, right? I choose not to. I think that abundant scholarship suggests that this is you know very much the result of the long reach of post-internment trauma. Um, it goes hand in hand with tough work to reestablish communities after World War II, um, hard-learned skills in um, how to perform Americanness, if you will, things like volunteering for the military and accepting the, the terms and the bounty of the U.S. class system, right? So Japanese Americans are now basically one of the most socioeconomically successful Asian American ethnic groups. Uh, they really stand out in that way. They've done well. Now, Two Japanese American performance traditions are particularly vibrant, sustained, and thriving. And I'm going to argue, and they are of course Taiko and Bonadori, I'm going to argue that they're uniquely Japanese American um, and not sort of Japanese. They're obviously originally from Japan in various ways, but unlike the martial arts, um, you know, bonsai and ikebana, uh, dance, Nihon Buyo, um, classical music like Naga Uta, Koto, da 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 um, Unlike all of those things, all of those which are taught but are much less popular in North America, Taiko and Bonodori are both invented traditions. This is, this is just a matter of historical record, invented traditions, and that's an important point. 
they are not fabrications. They are real traditions, but they are and were invented. They were very deliberate cultural creations by specific people, individuals, you know, who very intentionally created um, something new out of traditional materials. I'll show you more of that as, as I go on. Um, Taiko and Bonodori basically have very animated presences in the Japanese American community, but I would argue in, in very, very different ways. Um, for one, one way, even if you are not of, of Japanese descent, um, like I think most of you in this room, if not all of you, um, you are probably already aware of Taiko. You've seen it, you've heard it, you've, you know, whatever. You've probably experienced Taiko in one way or another. I'm guessing you probably um, have not experienced Bonodori. That remains more sort of within the community, as it were. Actually, I don't even know if Bonodori is practiced in Australia, and this is something I'd like to know more about. Um, oh, one last picture. That's model minority facts, figures, and statistics. Um, you know, just for the sake of efficiency, uh, these are the two traditions I'm, I'm going to, you know, say more about as I go on here. Um, taiko, of course, these, is, these are ensembles of, um, you know, massed traditional uh, Japanese drums. Um, they basically pull together traditional festival rhythms with, with a lot of jazz thrown in, and that's part of its story from the 1950s. Um, this one man, this one, one you know, became a taiko teacher. Um, Oguchi Sensei is the one who did it. He was originally a jazz drummer and he, you know, got together some drums and started to play jazz on them basically and the rest is history. <laughs> Literally is history. Um, taiko is very much both a Japanese tradition and now a worldwide global phenomenon all at the same time. Um, it's absolutely both participatory and community-based and it's also gone professional with very particular figures. That's pretty fascinating. And taiko as I said, is well known to general audiences at this point. Bon Odori is very, very different. These are big participatory uh, uh, dance circles, danced in, in, in unison, as you will see. Um, they're originally, you know, quote unquote, traditional from rural areas. It's, you know, from village culture, basically, originally. Um, whereas Taiko or Kumidaiko is very secular at this point. Bon Odori is ritual, it's, it's Buddhist ritual dance. Um, it was created in the 1930s by a particular um, immigrant Buddhist priest, as you'll see in a few minutes. Um, it's mostly a Japanese American traditional. It's absolutely participatory. It's about, it's about getting out there and dancing. It's not about watching professionals do it. Um, and as I said, non-Japanese Americans are pretty much not familiar with it because it's, it's, it's inside the community, as it were. Now, why worry about traditions that are doing just fine? Why worry? In some ways, I'm asking what the, what the price of success uh, may be. Does it result in the absorption or the disappearance of the originating community? That's something to, to really think about. Does it result in multiple communities of practice? In this case, yes, I think so. And thus force us to consider um, at what point must we explicitly stop thinking of it as one tradition? I, I'm starting to think that taiko is more than one tradition at this point. And even if, you know, like the music sounds the same as it were, which it does within the taiko community as it is, you know, imagined, is it in fact multiple traditions? If we focus on communities rather than the music object, what fissures become more visible and more audible? Okay, more on, more on taiko here. This is fuden taiko. In some places, uh, taiko is no longer connected to the Japanese diaspora at all, at all really. If we understand diaspora to mean, you know, the movement of Japanese communities around the globe, okay? This group, Fuden Daiko, is connected to a Zen Buddhist temple in Italy, in the country of Italy, Fudenji Buddhist temple. They invited my teacher, Reverend Tom Kurai, to come teach them taiko as part of their Zen practice. So, what I'm saying is that all the members of Fuden Daiko are Italian Zen Buddhists, okay? <laughs> Italian Zen Buddhists. And none of them are of Japanese descent. None of them, zero. The, the only person you're seeing in the photograph who, who is you know, Japanese in any way, shape, or form is my teacher, who is Japanese American, right? Reverend Tom. Um, so the interest of all of these, these particular Italian 
taiko players is um, Zen. That's their connection to it. You know, they want to know more about Zen Buddhism, and they're learning about it through taiko, you know, is what's going on here. They invited my teacher to come spend time with them. Um, yeah, there's Reverend Tom. <laughs> um, now, Zen. Okay, obviously, Zen is from, from Japan originally, right? And then it moves off into the rest of the world. There's lots of people interested in Zen. The Italian Zen Buddhist community, as it were, that, that taiko community is now basically sort of, you know, an outgrowth of the worldwide Zen community. And it's not, not at all, you know, uh, Zen is not ethnic Japanese outside of Japan. In fact, you know, a Zen priest outside of Japan is more apt to look like this woman. This is a Zen Buddhist priest in Germany, okay? Um, this is a Zen priest from the United States. He's actually a controversial figure. Um, so Zen has become, outside of Japan, you know, a very, very white practice, as a matter of fact. Sure, there are, there are non-white people who practice Zen Buddhism, of course, but I'm talking about, you know, sort of patterns, you know, and, and, and dominant presences within it. So both of the North American, Western Europe in particular, um, Zen is very white, as a matter of fact. And, and I'm talking about, I don't mean to sound dismissive, and I hope I don't, um, you know, these are serious practitioners, you know, but I'm saying that Zen has moved off in, in significant ways. Um, so, these Italian Buddhist taiko players, they are and they are not connected to the Japanese uh, community or the North American uh, uh, taiko community or the global taiko community. They're, they're, they're a particular kind of taiko player, you could say. Um, long story short, um, taiko is a global phenomenon. I want you at this point, you need to, I know you've seen taiko, but um, I'd like you to See some more taiko, just for a moment. Hey, it's the second time I've done that. I'd like you to see um, just a two-minute clip of um, every two years is a big North American taiko conference where hundreds and hundreds of taiko players get together, and it's 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 community. Uh oh. So how do I flip screens? Sorry, I'm seeing the video here, but you're not seeing it up there, are you? Thank you. That's, uh, I don't know. Just a little taste. So what was I talking about? I was saying that taiko is a global phenomenon. That's what I was saying. And that the North American Taiko Conference takes place every two years. Hundreds of people come, almost a thousand actually. So that's what you just saw. 
So to sum up the Tycho phenomenon at this point, um, it's an invented tradition. It's an invented tradition that's absolutely vibrant in Japan as well. It's well established in North America and in Latin America. Um, and then it spread, uh, not through the Japanese diaspora to Western Europe and to Australia. And from the 1960s to around the year 2000, it was mostly played by Japanese Americans and other Asian Americans. And then starting around the year 2000 or so, uh, white taiko enthusiasts have like grown rapidly in, in number and in, in size. And in Australia and Western Europe in particular, most um, taiko players are, are predominantly white, you know, often with a few Shin Issei or, you know, new uh, Japanese immigrant um, uh, performers. So, Bon Odori. There we go. Bon Odori are the dances. I'm shifting to the other tradition I want to talk about. Bon Odori are the dances that are performed um, as part of um, Obon, which is a, a Buddhist um, um, often called festival, but basically a ritual in the summertime. O, bon odori, bon means obon, odori means dance. Um, these are these huge unison circle dances done um, as part of, of obon. And frankly, participating in them has been like my most profound experiences as a taiko player. Um, and this is something I've done every summer at multiple temples, you know, for about 18 years now. Um, it's all about dancing. It's not about playing taiko, but I go, and many of us go, as taiko players to, to participate in this. Um, it's deeply related to taiko, even though you're not playing taiko when you're doing it, right? And it's taught me um, as much about taiko as actually playing, that's for sure. Now, Obon is a summer uh, Buddhist uh, ritual where the living should remember and honor the dead, and the dances themselves carry this this explicitly utopian purpose uh, realized through participation and praxis. Um, you are supposed to dance, and in dancing you are supposed to lose your ego, to just let go of your ego. And in the act of getting over yourself, uh, you vanish into this messy, unwieldy, colorful, beautiful, awkward totality you know, of the crowds that dance together. And they are crowds. Hundreds and hundreds of people dance together. Essentially, you become the body politic uh, because you are a part of it, even as an individual. Community and self are collapsed, is what I'm saying. And, and community is not abstract in this ad environment at all. Hundreds of people dance in any given um, Obon festival. And those people are uh, mostly Japanese Americans along with their families who are interracial and multiracial and intraracial, right? So what you get are, is the sight of hundreds and hundreds of people uh, making the same movements together in unison. It's very, very powerful. Um, and it's even more powerful to feel one's own movements um, amplified through, through hundreds of other bodies. So you're seeing some pictures I took this just this past summer in the last few months at different Obon festivals um, in Southern California um, where I live. This is, we're going to go through the whole YouTube thing again here, but um, I'd like you to see um, this one particular Bon Odori dance called uh, Bon Odori Uta, which is done at the beginning and end of, of, each, um, of each evening. I'm just going to stay in here and let's see if it opens. Nope. <laughs> Okay, so how did we flip this? Let's see.
Talk about participatory discrepancies, huh? There's like people dancing the same thing in so many different ways, right? I love that. I absolutely love that. Okay. Yay. Okay, we're back. Um, so I wanted you to see sort of the, <laughs> the messy totality of Bonodori in, in Southern California. Um, like Tycho, Bon Odori is often, there we go, is often talked about and affectively experienced as if it were very old, but the Southern California tradition is in fact not old at all, not old. The dances were introduced and established in the 1930s by this immigrant uh, Jodo Shinshu minister, Reverend um, Iwanaga and his, his second generation Japanese American wife. And at that point in time, Obon was not a regular or a prominent observance in, in California's Buddhist, uh, you know, Japanese Buddhist temples. Bon Odori is a very old ritual practice, but it has been absolutely continuously, you know, reconstituted over, over time, over history. For centuries in Japan, Bon Odori was associated with rural uh, the rural labor class, and it was participatory with no professional dancers. Then, in the 1860s, it was banned in Japan from the 1860s to about 1912. Um, basically, the government at that time felt that Bon Odori was um, encouraging licentious behaviors, right? So they, they outlawed Bon Odori. There was this absolute historical rupture there. And that is precisely during that period when many of the Japanese immigrants who ended up in the United States, you know, grew up. So they all grew up without any experience of Bon Odori. Those are the folks who came to the U.S. and they were not doing Obon and they were not dancing these dances. Now, from 1942 to 1945, you know, I, I hope you know this, all Japanese Americans on the West Coast were put into the concentration camps, right? And these three years, historically, were a complete rupture for the Japanese American community. Financially, politically, psychologically, culturally, it was a complete rupture, right? And the impact is still felt um, today, 70 years later, you know. People are still very much alive who were interned, who were born in intern internment camps and so on and so forth. Any, many Asian American scholars and activists have charted the many, many ways the Japanese Americans still seem compelled to show how American they are as a result of all of that and, and are still working through basically the violence to, to community, to family structures, and of course to individual um, identity. Now, Reverend Iwanaga, um, and his family and his congregation were all put in internment camps. And there he is in, 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 in Poston, one of the ones in Arizona. Um, this picture is so striking because they're all smiling, they're all smiling, but they're all basically being carted away to an internment camp. Um, so remember that at this point in time, Bon Odori had only been part of the Japanese American um, sort of, you know, practice for about 10 years. It was still an absolutely new tradition at this point in time. Um, however, in the internment camps, new though it was at that point, Bon Odori was held at almost all of the, the 10 internment camps. It was celebrated in a big way. And I want you to see this wonderful, remarkable series of um, photographs of um, Bonodori in the camps. There's Reverend Iwanaga with uh, Buddhist youth. Um, there's a series of, 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 well, three sets of photographs, as you'll see, of Bonodori being, being danced at Amache, at Manzanar, um, and, and Granada. I'll try to be fairly quick about this, but I love these photos because these are all taken by, by Japanese American internees, right? This is not like official documentation by the government. Um, these are photos taken by Japanese Americans of Japanese Americans. And of course, you immediately think, oh look, a mixture of dress, right? Kimono plus American dress. Notice the the people watching as well as the women dancing. This is one of the photographers, all the, the next 20 slides or so are of his work. Um, this is an absolute amazing collection of um, sort of documentation of, of what was going on in the camps from the perspective of an internee. I just want to show you his Bonodori photos. Look at this. So in my book I do a fairly extensive sort of just look at what these photographs tell us about participation, about the kind of body politic that was being constituted through, through these, big, these big ritual dances. 
You see the white lines that they have on the ground for, for the dancing. You know, of course, this is in the middle of the desert, right? All the people watching. And clearly, as night fell, they kept dancing. They kept dancing. Mostly women dancing, right? But not entirely. Mostly women. Mostly young women. They're wearing sort of elaborate kimono in a way that's rarely worn today. Oh, this is the refreshment stand, actually. <laughs> Just <laughs> still part of Bon Odori. People lined up to get drinks. Heart Mountain, dancing into the night. Okay, and just to close this this part off. So Bon Odori was absolutely danced in the camps in the 1970s. Jumping forward in time. Um, Bonodori was brought back to the camps, I guess is the best way to put it. Obviously, Bonodori offered this really powerful connective force, you know, of participatory performance in the camps, is my point. And I would go so far as to say that community was actively reconstituted through the dances. Um, and it's for that reason, I think, that in the 1970s, when activists, mostly young Japanese Americans, began to organize pilgrimages to the sites of the camps, which at that point were, you know, in ruins. Um, they began to go back to the camps, as you see in this photograph, um, as part of this political movement to demand uh, reparations from the United States government for, for um, the violation of civil rights, right? Um, and these pilgrimages, which began in the 70s and are still held annually um, right up to today, uh, they always end uh, with a big bon odori. So what you're seeing here from one of the first pilgrimages are, are young um, activists, many of them Asian American, but not all of them, right? You know, African American guy over here, a couple of white folks over here, uh, dancing at the, the end of the, um, the day's events. Um, and here you see, just a few years ago, Manzanar. You see some college students up front. They're from actually UCLA's Taiko group and a bunch of people in back notice um, Notice this young woman in, in hijab, right? Um, there's a strong presence of Muslim Americans at the pilgrimages because there's so much discussion around uh, civil rights issues. Um, so, Bonodori and the pilgrimages. I think that to dance in the remote desert areas, you know, where all these camps were located, you know, surrounded by other participants who, who, who together choose to sustain political memory, that's a very powerful experience. So it's no coincidence that that bon odori is part of, of uh, political ritual practice in these, these pilgrimages. All right, coming to the end of things here. The hour draws on, right? One last view of Manzanar. Note, note the taiko drums in the middle of the bon odori circle. Um, moving towards a conclusion here of sorts. Uh, George Lipsitz, one of my favorite scholars of all time, uh, he, he wrote, or writes, um, that ethnomusicology can help us see where, which differences make a difference. And I think that's the best note on which to, to try to draw this together. Um, I'm asking which differences make a difference for Taiko and for Bon Odori. I think, I think that their vibrancy is, is related, but her heart is actually very different. Taiko being so dynamic and, and alive and Bon Odori also being very alive. Taiko is in the process of, I think, time will tell, um, moving out of the Japanese American community. I'm almost certain that that's what's going on here. Um, Non-Asian American participants often come to Taiko looking for rather 
rather than looking for an Asian American experience, they're often looking for a Japanese experience, right? You know, they're in, in search of some sort of authentic Japanese culture, you know, rather than a Japanese American historical understanding. I guess what I'm saying is that Taiko very easily becomes um, an essentialized practice, you know, one in which um, non-Asian Americans are looking for some fantasy of Japan. You know, I see this over and over again, in which Taiko is, is almost deliberately then recast as, you know, ancient and Japanese, you know, rather than, in fact, the post-war cultural hybrid practice that it is, you know? And what comes lost becomes lost along the way are, are, are the profound ways in which Taiko emerged as, as a way for Japanese Americans to assert a very noisy political presence, right? So what's, what's going on here, I think, is a gradual but pronounced sort of de-linking of Taiko from the Japanese American community and, and indeed Japanese American history. So as Taiko proliferates, you know, and as groups spring up all over the world, right, it's becoming something else is my argument. It sounds like the same stuff, but I don't think it is. I'm, 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 I'm really questioning whether it's the same thing. A site for cultural experimentation and participation that has less to do with Japanese American history and more to do with white fascination with an Asian other. So, um, Bon Odori, however, <laughs> remains very solidly located within Japanese American Buddhist practice. It's very striking. It e exemplifies the kind of participatory community making theorized so nicely by, by ethnomusicologist Tom Torino. Um, bon Odori basically constitutes, um, I think, I feel very deeply actually, a new kind of Japanese American body politic. Even one that is full of multiracial families who still self identify as, you know, Yonsei and Gosei, fourth and fifth generation Japanese American. So I think that Taiko and Bon Odori are telling us um, a really complicated story about cultural sustainability and racialized experience, and those things are deeply related. Um, bon Odori very continuously reconstitutes this shattered community, right? And it does it in, in powerfully necessary ways. Whereas Taiko, I think, may be, become less and less Japanese American as time goes on. And without question, both traditions and both of these a reminder, our invented traditions, um, both of them are alive and um, thriving, indeed, thriving, but in ways that I think demand attention to the very terms for community. So in sum, in closing, the Sustainable Futures Project, you know, has really forced me to consider these, these matters. Um, I don't think I would have if I hadn't had the privilege of, of watching this project unfold over the last five years. Um, it's also helped me to think through the terms for community making and, and on the other hand, community breaking. And it's also led me to wonder whether uh, the sustainability project doesn't really have communities at its heart rather than music. <laughs> um, you know, I think, you know, and I mean that is in, in the best of ways. Um, you know, really, the, the music practices that, 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 that you've looked at in the nine, the nine places um, you know, offer, you know, these real signs, you know, almost like a canary in a gold mine kind of thing. Um, signs of community dynamism, uh, change, transformation, all those things, you know. And sometimes, sometimes a dynamic music that, you know, sweeps you along with its, you know, sheer noise and its vigor, um, sometimes it's actually telling you a very different story about um, forgetting and separation, even though it appears to be so very, very alive. So I'll close on that note, which suddenly sounded far more pessimistic than I meant it to. <laughs> but, but these are the things that your project has really you know, pushed me to, to think about. And I, I thank you for that. Yeah. So, and thanks for listening. Oh, I have one more slide. Yeah. Okay. Um. <laughs> Would you answer some questions, uh, because I think there might be some around the table. Yeah. yeah. I'd be interested to know what you think of how much um, outsiders' interest in um, the might be, could, could be related to 
the inequality and justices, the whole issue surrounding the internment. So, um, you know, if, alongside, say, a, a fascination with Asia, but could it just could it also be partly linked to um, you know, someone's people's wanting uh, to be part of equality and equality making and you know justice seeking, you know, as opposed. Could there be two elements to people's interests? Different reasons why people absolutely not Japanese American folks. Absolutely. I mean, I hope so, right? You know, this is the beautiful thing about performance forms of any kind is that they invite often, you know, multiple, you know, a proliferation of, of intentions and needs, right? You know, and, and, and those can end up sometimes being at odds with one another and sometimes, you know, being interconstitutive and supportive of one another. So, you know, the short answer is yes, I think so. Yeah. Is that what you were getting? from it or wondering. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Other questions? Natalie. Natalie. When we saw the clip of the Bonner Brody in LA, was it in LA? Yeah. The music that they were dancing to, was this specifically composed for the band? I actually write quite a bit about it. Um, those are recordings. Sorry, I'm going to mess up the sound on your... <laughs> I just realized that the microphone's like way down there. Um, um, those are recordings. They're almost entirely from Japan. Um, there's this long, complicated schizophonic history of, of you know, dancing to those recorded sounds. Um, yeah, and that's become simply expected in Japanese-American circles. Uh, it's, it's completely fascinating because it has to do with um, ideas of here and there and tradition and... Yeah, yeah. So you, good for you for picking up on that. Yeah, and and they all use the same recordings, by the way. You know, from between different temples. There's this whole history of, of um, redubbing. <laughs> they these recordings were originally on on you know 78s, you know, and then they were re-recorded onto you know whatever cassettes. And people grew up talking about how the cassettes would get old and tired and start to get wobbly and, you know, demagnetized and the sound of that was just like, you know, it was part of the tradition, right? You know, so, yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. <laughs> yeah. Are you saying, Kimber, that um, sustainability, in your opinion, is sustainability about the different traditions um, evolving with the, you know, influences from the community over time um, through historical or economic or social um, reasons. But I see the two traditions you've talked about, they've both um, morphed in different ways. Yeah. Um, and so is, is that what you're saying is one of the criteria for sustainability? <laughs> for Yikes. Um, <laughs> you know, like some of the other traditions, maybe um, the more obscure types of um, Japanese traditions that, that aren't as popular or haven't really um, Continue. Um, yeah. Why? Why is that? Why? Why are these two ones really um, strengthened and the other side? Yeah, that's an absolutely great question. Um, you know, of course, in no way am I really qualified to, to answer it in any 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 deep way. But I mean, those are the kinds of questions that the entire project, you know, sort of yeah. begs. Yeah. You know, right? And and I think it also makes it clear how. How very contingent, you know, all of this is. You know, there's the five domains, and and the way in which, um, you know, they interact has everything to do with with you know the end result of, you know, health and vibrancy or or you know endangerment. I do you want to say anything more to that because you know you're more obviously much more deeply engaged in in that question really. But as, as you, you say, it's, it's the interaction between all these different different forces that that that. Decides where where things mm -hmm. go, and then I think what what you're giving is a strikingly different example from any of the, the traditions huh. we looked at. Although huh. it's a bit similar to Samonori, which is also an yeah. Indian tradition. Very very similar. And yeah. but one of the things that I find really striking, and got Nick and Liz here, who are involved with indigenous music, where the music is very very closely related to the culture, the people. Um, I haven't you heard you use the word appropriation once, huh. and actually it, it's moving away from its ethnic associations more and more yeah so that I found really interesting what I found most interesting in relation to sustainability is the explosion of the interest of it across the world me too so 
one thing that we, I haven't thought about yet is whether these extreme explosions can actually lead to a collapse. We all, sat, with sadness, remember the history of the hula hoop, um, <laughs> hoop. which started uh, as a very small thing and then mm. started spreading across the world. Huh. And the guy who invented it, who had the patent on it, started building bigger factories and bigger factories and bigger factories. And suddenly, the market was saturated and he went bankrupt because oh he had God. built these huge factories uh, with the money that he made from selling hula hoops, expecting it to expand and expand and expand and expand, uh -huh. but it just fell flat at one, one stage. Oh, wow. And is there, one wonders if there's, there's an example of a tradition that spread so much, and we've seen that with the Indian, India craze in the 1960s, so okay. it spread yeah. very quickly and then it fell flat, but it had, had a small group of people there. Okay. And a slower expansion of Western classical music, and yeah. before that, um, in the hundred years after the death of Muhammad, of uh, mm. Islamic of music from the world of Islam, okay. which spread very quickly. But um. this is an extreme explosion of things. So I is think there a so. risk that it just falls flat at one stage? I, I'm just from an ecosystem uh, thing. Can you have me too? Uh, a kind of cane toad or uh, rabbit uh, effect where it spreads so much that it actually starts to be self-destructive in, in, in one stage. We're, we're going to find out, I think. Yeah. yeah. Will you, you know. write about that, Deborah? <laughs> <laughs> we all need to just keep watching, you know, or if it just becomes something else, right? Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, yeah. Yeah. Which it already is, but actually so is Western is. classical music, for instance. Western classical music yeah. being performed in China is not the same thing as the salon music of the 19th century, of course, right. it's just a very different, it's the same, but that, that, that I find one of the, the key, interesting key ideas, it's the same tradition, but it's actually different. So okay. it sounds the same, but it's actually a different tradition. The repertoire is the same, the instruments yeah. are the same, yeah. the, you know, but you're arguing it's a different tradition, really. Maybe, well, okay. it's, it's, it sounds the same, yeah. but it is different, I think I, it's very useful. I'm willing uh, to go with that, looking, yeah, yeah. You know, that's where I begin to think, oh, maybe the music object isn't the, the thing to follow. You yeah. know, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. Thanks, Deborah. It's great to hear you talking mm -hmm. again after, what did we work out, seven years? Or Something yeah. like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting to hear how your thinking has changed and shifted. And huh. one of the things I was really interested to hear throughout your talk was the use of various terms around race. We talked oh. about post-race, you've used white, Asian, other, and you're talking to have racialized. And I guess what I'm interested in is how you're theorizing that beyond a binary, um, which, and then you know, we talk about whiteness as a race and whiteness as performativity. Yeah. And then thinking mm. about some theories from, say, Patricia Hill Collins, who talks about the matrix mm. of domination, yeah. race, gender, class, and you talked about a first world white um, kind of population that's taking over Tycho. And I wonder yeah. if you, how you've been theorizing through that kind of lens. Yeah. I mean, thank you for sort of paying attention to the, my terminology. Um, I'm very much coming from an American ethnic studies perspective on all of this with, with the absolute, you know, from square one assumption that, that race is always a construct, um, that new racial formations come into being in conversation with preceding ones, um, that it's all in motion, <laughs> that the black-white binary, you know, is um, already interrupted by the Asian American, the Latino, the, you know, by all other forms of, of um, by all the non-black white paradigms. Um, all those things are, are just operating for me all the way through. Um, and any use of, any, any of my uses of, of whiteness as, as a paradigm are, are very deliberate. Um, do I think that all whites are the same? Of course I don't, <laughs> of course I don't. But I'm talking about um, a historicized racial formation of whiteness, you know, and, and very deliberate ways, um, you know, and it is meant to provoke. Um, I, I do think that white people have ethnicity and other forms of difference, I do. But I also think that, that specific racial formations of whiteness have moved through the world in very powerful ways. And there's no arguing about that. It moved with colonialism, it's moved with late capitalism. Um, you know, it remains one of the most powerful forces in the world and it's, it's pretty stunning to see that played out over and over again, including through Tycho. So you know. neo-colonialism? Yeah, yeah, what do you think? I don't know. 
I don't know, you think, you think very deeply yeah, about these matters. It. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Don't get me wrong, white taiko players are some of my best friends. That's not the <laughs> issue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's late, isn't it? I'm sort of, you know, like, not sort of, I am very impressed that you all managed to come to a talk at 6 p.m. after a long day <laughs> and are still hanging in there. But um, if you'd like to just hang and chat afterwards, I'm, I'm quite open to it. But thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Constantly, every time we, mm. we, we, we get to meet you, mm. bring up new ideas and, and new challenges to, to <laughs> existing ideas. And it's incredibly valuable to have you here. Thank you all for yeah, Thanks for here. having me. Um, mm. Thank you very much for thank you very much for <laughs>